All right, welcome to, um, I think, the first panel session of supercomputing. So thanks to everyone for, for making it in person, and thanks to everyone for online for joining. Uh, this session is titled Beyond the Hype, Is There a Typical AI ML Storage Workload? Um, and so we're really hoping to delve into the question of storage and AI, and where are we, and where are we going? Uh, we have some awesome panelists that have uh, joined us uh, to answer all of those questions. And so hopefully you'll walk away knowing everything uh, you need to know. Um, we uh, unfortunately uh, couldn't get any of the panelists here in person. Um, so we, uh, they're all online, as you can see, um, from the uh, US and Europe. And uh, yeah, so anyways, thanks to everyone. If you have further on follow on questions, I'm sure um, the panelists would be open to it and you can contact us and we can uh, you know, connect you if uh, in some way or other after, after the panel. All right, so my name's Dean Hildebrand um, and I've been working in storage for, I don't know, 20 years or so and uh, the last five years or so, people keep asking uh, where is AI and storage going? So that was sort of my uh, emphasis or creating this panel and getting the people that know way more than I do on this topic. Do uh, you want to introduce yourself, Jay? Sure. So I'm Jay Lofsted. I'm at Sandia National Labs. And um, my history in storage isn't as deep as Dean's, but I've been working in this area for a bit more than 10 years now. And um, kind of the other direction that we've come at this from is um, with our IO500 benchmark and competition, one of the things that we've been trying to figure out is, is there a way that we can represent AI and machine learning workloads in a way that is useful for people rather than just something like 4K random reads that we don't think really maps to anything. It's just something that everybody measures. So we're really trying to explore through this panel and interactively with both the panelists and you and the audience to find out what is it that actually makes up an AI workload and is there a way to actually benchmark for these things so that we can actually make our storage systems work better for them? Um, so the way we're gonna operate uh, the panel is um, we're gonna start off with some introductions and then uh, iterate through uh, each of the panelists. We'll have five minutes to talk about you know, their viewpoint on the subject. Um, Instead of just having them all rattle off in a row, uh, my thought was what we'll do is have each one go and then we'll have the panelists ask each other questions as well as um, the audience then uh, ask some questions between each of them. Uh, and we have an hour and a half, so I don't think we'll be limited for time. And then at the end, once we've gone through all the, the five presentations, then uh, we'll open it up for just Q&A generally and, and hope to have a good conversation after that. Um, so please feel free to, to ask questions. Um, so in order to ask questions, we have the Slido in Hub. So please open up your laptops uh, if you'd like, uh, especially, well, you already have them open if you're online. And you can ask questions there. Uh, Jay specifically will be making sure to pay attention to those questions. Um, but then if you're in the room here, uh, we do have a wonderful student volunteer named Robert. Yeah. Robert's uh, doing part B. Oh, there he is there in he the is. corner. He has an actual physical mic. I know that sounds crazy. Um, and he's going to, so if you raise your hand during uh, uh, the question period, he'll run over and offer the mic. And then uh, what you say into the mic will go straight into the Zoom and the panel, so I'll be able to hear it. Um, so um, we haven't tried this yesterday, so you know, be patient. And hopefully, we'll uh, get all this, uh, the tech working together. Um, so let me introduce uh, the panel. So first we have Fei Yi Wang, uh, who's the group leader of analytics and AI methods at uh, the scale group over at Oak Ridge. Um, we have Abdul Salim, Salem, uh, who's been at Google for over 14 years and is now working in the ads ML infrastructure group as a, a software engineer. Uh, we have CJ Newburn, uh, who's a principal architect at NVIDIA and uh, one of the co-architects of GPU Direct for Storage. Um, we also have Anthony Kugas, who's a research assistant professor over at Illinois Tech, and uh, he's someone uh, that has spent a lot of time looking at I.O. patterns and uh, storage. And we have Anna Klimovich, I hope I got that right, 
Um, assistant professor at ETH Zurich and um, leads the Efficient Architectures and Systems Lab over there and is part of the team that created TF Data, uh, which is the uh, TensorFlow data processing framework. And so, you know, the goal with this panel has really been to try to get some users into the panel, some actual practitioners who are building the systems, uh, and as well as some researchers to give their um, perspective on the, on the topic. So I think we have an awesome panel today. Um, anything else to say before we get going? Uh, no, we just had a question in the Slido about the audio being too loud. Is it still too loud and distorted? Was that virtually or was that in I'm assuming in it was room? virtually. Oh, we've got a question mark for, oh no, it's somebody else. How, how does it sound in the room here? Oh, it's good? it says it's going good. Okay. And will this be recorded? Have we turned the recording on? Ah, uh, yes. Uh, I believe this will be recorded. Um, thanks for reminding yep. me. And is that started? Yep. Yeah. Okay. We That's are recording. This. Yeah. So this will be available for replay into January, I believe. Yeah. 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 Okay. Awesome. All right, so our first uh, presenter is Fei Yi Wang from Oak Ridge. Um, Fei Yi, uh, would you like to take it away uh, for five minutes? Sure, can you hear me? Yeah, it sounds yeah. great. All right, so thank, thank you, Dean and Jay, for the introduction, and I appreciate the opportunity uh, for being here. Uh, since the preference is no slide, I, I have some talk point, but no slides. Uh, so first, uh, uh, a little bit the self-introduction and the background. My name is Fei Yiwang. I'm the uh, group lead for the analytic and AI master at SKU, also known as AIMS Group. So organization-wise, uh, my group sits in the division of National Center for Computational Science, or better known as Oak Ridge Leadership Computing Facility. Uh, we design, deploy, and operate HPC systems. Uh, including current summit and the upcoming frontier. So uh, this group focuses on uh, benchmarking, tuning, and optimizing AI models and frameworks, and the provision and the deploy uh, such AI and the machine learning ecosystem uh, onto our flagship supercomputer. So the grand mission or goal is to make AI work for science. Uh, in operation and uh, at extreme scale. Uh, so personally, before I started at AIMS Group, I've been involved in the design, uh, procurement, and acceptance test of several large-scale storage systems, uh, including the very old Spider system, if you can remember, that supports the Jaguar and the Titan. Uh, also, the Alpine system that supports the Summit and more recently, the Oran system that will support the frontier. So I have keen interest on understanding on how machine learning and deep learning workload uh, as far as I was concerned, and how we can best support them in the future system acquisition. And I will briefly talk about some of, some of the facility, facility perspective on the MLDL storage support. Uh, the goal is to give you uh, a lay of the land or some baseline to consider. So when we started the summit, uh, the request for proposal, RFP, roughly five years ago, the IO storage requirement is really focusing on the traditional workload. We have checkpoint restart requirement, we have data sharing requirement, for example, it has to be a, a centralized file system, we have uh, in-situ analysis requirement, we have metadata requirement, um, but the machine learning workload requirement is really skinny there. Uh, the only uh, line I can find there is about read caching, and it's talk about how applications such as deep learning require repeated read of the training file, and the caching of the read close to the compute, compute partition uh, is needed. So for Frontier, I guess we have a, a, a more focused requirement, but uh, that's a different story. So what we end up with on Summit, as most of you know, is a, a big GPFS file system with 250 petabytes, uh, pet, uh, petabytes and with uh, 2.5 terabytes per second. The per, well, that's a peak performance. 
And if you average out onto per node, we are talking about about 540 megabytes per second write performance. We also ended up with a burst buffer system. We have 4,608 NVMe device. Uh, altogether, the SSD device uh, have about seven petabytes in total. And each such SSD device offer about one million 4K read per second, with read about five gig per second, and read about two gig per second. So on total, uh, we offer about 10 terabytes per second aggregate read and the 27 terabytes per second aggregate, aggregate read uh, if, you, if you are using all the nodes. So I know Jay talked about the, 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 the 4K random read does not count, but when we did the procurement, we did have a rough number in mind. So for the GPFS as a file system, it altogether have about 100 million 4K random read performance. And for the NVMe devices, we have about 4.5 billion uh, operations per second. And we don't have a shared file system overlay on top of these raw devices, and it has lots of implications, uh, which I can touch on later. So um, as far as the uh, summit uh, machine learning job goes, uh, I have a, a set of data I can share, but probably for later. Roughly, uh, we analyzed about the 10 million Darshan log uh, in 2020 on summit. And that belongs to about 300,000 jobs uh, uh, presented on the uh, uh, job scheduler uh, logging uh, panel. And uh, there's um, many, many caveats on how we analyzed the, um, the machine learning job and its workload characteristics. So down to the individual, it doesn't really, um, I, I don't think they are accurate to the exact number, but I hope the statistic overall is meaningful. So altogether over that particular year, 2020, we have about 23,000 HPC machine learning jobs. And this is based on some keyword extractions. So among these machine learning jobs, only about 1,000-ish jobs making use of first buffer storage device we provided. And I can talk more about these characteristics, but um, so that probably give you some basic ideas on what we have and uh, the kind of machine learning jobs are, are how they are taking advantage of our burst buffer systems. Um, I think the last thing I want to mention is um, even though we have altogether about 27 uh, GPUs on Summit, but most of the machine learning jobs run on less than 45 nodes. And that's not the number of GPUs, since each node has six GPUs. So you can multiply 45 by six. So that's roughly the, the scale we are looking at. Um, so that's it for me now. If you have further questions, I, I hope this provides a, a rough uh, look at uh, what the summit is offering today. So let me start with a quick question, Fei, and then open it up to the rest of the panel. But um, do you have a like a one minute or a two minute quick summary of so how's it going? Um, how are these ML jobs running on Summit? Is it working well? Um, is there any you know just uh, huge holes uh, or gaps that you're seeing uh, on the storage side? I think the most of the uh, what we call the small scale and the medium scale ML jobs will just run fun. Uh, the real tickets are coming from the uh, the flagship scale jobs, and we have uh, all together on that particular year uh, we are talking about the 77 machine learning jobs at the flagship scale, uh, which means it run on about a thousand to four thousand summit nodes and you have to multiply six to get the total number of GPUs. 
I think a lot of issues we're seeing are coming from uh, the ML ecosystem where uh, there's this compatibility matrix we have to deal with. Some users prefer TensorFlow, some, some users prefer PyTorch, and then the, uh, the PowerPC, the Power9 support, uh, uh, I guess, bringing additional wrinkles to the whole effort and how to make it scale up. Awesome. Um, anyone else on the panel would like to ask a, a quick question to Faye before we move, open it up to the audience? Oh, hey, are you directly involved in much of the work that's related to the data management and orchestration that's being done um, there at Arnold? Can you repeat that? Sorry, I missed. Sure. Uh, there's quite a bit of effort, I think, uh, at ORNL and looking at uh, uh, related relations with other DOE data centers for sort of federated data management and uh, how that's being choreographed throughout the data center. Uh, are you very involved in that? Uh, not particularly, but I'm, I am aware of uh, there, there is this um, effort of uh, having a cross facility and even cross center uh, storage provision. Um, but I, I, don't, I don't think these are ML uh, in particular. Awesome. Uh, I have a question. Um, do you guys um, use any profiling tools for, you know, these running jobs? Like, are you collecting information about how the job did on top of the machine? And if yes, like, are these going to be maybe available to the public? Or are you guys doing any analysis about, you know, characterization of behavior of, of you know, both the storage, but the, also the GPU and the compute? Yes, uh, that's, a, that's a very good question. Uh, we do. Uh, so from the storage and the I.O. perspective, the primary workhouse is uh, Darshan Log. Um, but Darshan Log has its caveat. For example, at the deployment of Summit, the Darshan we deployed uh, will require you, uh, first of all, um, uh, we uh, do a module load by default and load it uh, uh, when you log into the system. So unless you intentionally unload the Darshan, so there will be the I.O. captured for your job. But I do know that some really large scale uh, runs, uh, such as Golden Bell runs, they uh, don't want to pay any of the performance penalty, however slight that might be. So in their job script, they do a module unload the Darshan, so we do not capture that kind of workload. Secondly, in the earlier version of a Darshan, and uh, if you are, if you, your I.O. occur um, outside of the MPI, you need MPI finalize, and that won't be captured uh, as well either. And another caveat is that if you, um, let's say you, you, you transfer data between the uh, parallel file system and uh, know the local device that is SSD and through the regular uh, copy or whatever whatever other data transferring tool. And that won't be captured by Darshan either. So there's a lot of hopes in terms of how comprehensive we capture the, uh, the IO workload that, that translates into the machine, uh, machine learning job as well. And on the compute, uh, we don't have a system-wide uh, um, you know, profiling tool, but we offer uh, a number of, uh, from more intrusive to less intrusive instrument instrumentation tools for you to profile. It's really up to the user. And we are trying to figure out a way to provide a Darshan equivalent for the compute profiling, but that's remain to be seen in production. Awesome, thanks. Uh, let me open it up to the, the audience. Um, I don't see anything on Slido at the moment, but anyone uh, in person here like to ask a question? Uh, to Fei Yu specifically? No, we're good at the moment. All right, why don't we move on to the, the next speaker? So from HPC scale to what we like to call Google scale, uh, Abdul, take it away. Hey, can you hear me? Yes. 
Uh, thanks, Dean and Jay. And uh, I'd first like to thank all of you guys for having me here. Um, you know, it's a real privilege to be here in among such great company. And this is a topic that I'm very interested in, so uh, I'm excited to see where it goes. Um, and you know, if I think of the challenges in ML storage, I would say that scale is definitely one of the first things that comes to mind. Um, you know, and there are a lot of different dimensions to the scaling problem. It's not just about data set sizes. You know, it, it is true that data set sizes are growing, and it's true that we need to be able to read data faster now with hardware accelerators. But, um, and that's definitely been a challenge to keep up with. Um, but there's another dimension here that I don't think we discuss as much, and it's about scaling the adoption of ML across an organization. So what do I actually mean by that? Well, building a system that supports just one model training in isolation, it's relatively easy. Um, what's more challenging is when you need to support thousands of engineers training models and collaborating on shared data sets. Um, so the work that these engineers tend to do is very, very data centric. They're trying out new features, training models on different subsets of data. And depending on the scale that you're operating, it may not be practical to materialize a new data set for each of these experiments. So what you end up looking for is an environment where we can share these massive data sets across engineers and evolve them in parallel, but also in place. And we also need dynamic ways to read data and transform it while trading. So none of this is obviously new. Um, traditional databases and data warehouses have been doing this type of thing for years. But one of the problems with ML, I think, is we're just starting to learn about these requirements. I mean, 20 years ago, we weren't, uh, we weren't using ML at the same scale we are today. We may have had a few models training on a few data sets, but we weren't really thinking about these large scale collaborative ML engineering efforts. And as we grow, we're realizing that large scale ML engineering requires some of the same data management functionality that we're used to in traditional BI applications. So there's, there's a really nice analogy that I, that I like, which compares ML engineering to software engineering. And if you think about it, in ML engineering, your data is very comparable to your source code you know, it's what actually makes up the model. And training a model is very similar to compiling your source code. So if you're a single engineer hacking away on a program, storing source code on your laptop works just fine. But when you grow into a large scale software engineering company, you really need to invest in a proper source control system with access controls and version history. And it's very similar when you scale up the ML engineering process. I'm not claiming that uh, ML storage can be solved with source control systems or, tra or, or with traditional databases, of course. But I do think we need some of the same functionality. Uh, but the scale and cost requirements that we're seeing from ML, ML systems is just way different. Um, I mean, some of these systems are, are massive. And so massive that if you combine the data storage sizes with the compute requirements needed to process them, you start to approach the physical limitations of what can be done in a single geographical location just due to power constraints. And, um, <clears throat> and things that you're used to doing in databases like shuffles and joins they're just simply non-starters at this scale. They're far too expensive. So what can we do? Well, I, I think we do have a good start on at least understanding the problem. Uh, we're realizing that we do actually need some of, the dame, some of the same data management capabilities that we're used to in traditional BI applications to effectively scale ML engineering. And we know that these systems need to scale and that we need some, of, but not all of the properties of traditional databases. Um, and we know that if we make certain concessions when building these systems, we can build much cheaper systems that have very different scaling properties. Um, now, th there are some design patterns that have shown to be successful with existing workloads, but I do think we need to be more forward looking. Um, hardware accelerators are making ML systems much more data hungry. And looking out five years, I think we really need to invest more to keep ahead of that growth. Um, but in general, I, I do think it's a very interesting space and I'm really happy to be a part of it. And uh, I'm happy to take any questions from the panel or from the audience. Awesome. Thanks, Abdul. Uh, anyone else on the panel uh, have a question for Abdul? Anna, you looked like you were about to ask something. Yeah, I think it's I, I, what you said really resonates with me. Um, uh, this uh, needing to share data sets or kind of make services for um, f so that engineers can collaborate. And um, I'm kind of wondering, do you think the challenges are uh, more in like data discovery and uh, recognizing which data sets are being shared or more so in the like uh, data ingestion pipelines, how data is pre-processed or even like the models themselves? Um, where do you think there's kind of most opportunity to make a difference? Um, 
Yeah, it's a good question. Thanks. Uh, I, I actually think it's full stack. Um, you know, sharing data is hard, um, both from a discoverability perspective and just realizing, like, when, when doing ML engineering at this scale, um, you know, and, and having that many contributors to a shared data set, you know, you, you naturally have problems with discoverability and just, you know, what are the right schemas to, to, uh, for your data. Um, but but, but I, I think that it does actually pose uh, challenges on the storage systems themselves. Um, like, uh, you know, going back to like the challenges that we're seeing just in ingestion, um, the fact that, you know, the, there isn't enough compute on these uh, hardware accelerators to do uh, a lot of the transformations and joins that we need. Um, and and e even seeing, you know, like just at this scale, like uh, bottlenecks in, in fabric and spinning disks. Um, so I, I think we'll need investments throughout the stack. All right, thanks. Uh, so, so there was a question from the Slido. It says, storage often lags behind other hardware development. Do you think there are software solutions that can help with this? Hmm. Um, yeah, I, I do think there, there are certain things that we can do to work around some of the bottlenecks that we're seeing. Um, I would say like some of the things that come to mind are uh, looking at um, cheaper compression algorithms. Uh, like, uh, you know, there's often a, a trade-off between CPU and, and uh, disk time. Um, so, so, so that's certainly something that we can look at. Better interchange formats. Uh, a, a lot of times where we are wasting a lot of time just uh, marshaling and unmarshaling data in, in, in really bad formats. Um, and, and, and just better, better, better data layouts um, you know, you know, there's a lot of work on in these parallel file systems when it comes to striping data. Um, uh, things like that are the top things that come to mind. Would anyone else on the panel like to tackle that question as well on uh, software uh, overcoming the, the the sort of lag of storage hardware? Oh. All right, uh, let's open it up. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. I think there are things that we're definitely going to need to, to do to um, sort of manage data and uh, the tiering of making the stuff that's actually important be accessible. So um, rather than answering it so much, maybe I can ask this question back to you, Adol, is um, if, if anybody is going to have more data than they know what to do with, it's Google, right? Um, so then it seems the question is not, you know, can I get the data, but which data is actually important? And how do I make that data accessible? So this notion of trying to, and there are, there's no way that you can have a human in the loop as you're processing all that data and analyzing the data. Um, so do you care to make any comments on the process of figuring out how to assess which data is of greater value or is uh, more likely to be used by uh, given demographics and then um, making that better accessible, uh, for example, uh, using tagging techniques and so on. Um, and, uh, and, and how do you see, I'll, I'll compound that question if I may, how do you see what you're learning at Google, because clearly you've done a lot in that space, uh, as becoming, being able to be more accessible to the masses for all these other data centers that aren't just going to be GCP? Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, so there, there's a few questions there. I'll, I'll try to um, get at them one by one. Um, I, I think I, I definitely agree that um, you know when looking at efforts around reducing costs and, and trying to work around the hardware bottlenecks, um, thinking about you know really thinking about what data is important to train on is is is, is really critical, and um, and not all data is created equal. Um, so. Um, there's a few ways you can look at it, um, and you can, you know, build heuristics and, and try to determine, you know, statically what data uh, provides the most value to a model. But um, a, a lot of the, like, some of the scaling challenges comes to repeatedly reading the same data over and over again from many different experiments, you know, across all of the models that you're training. So, like. There are methods that I think we can do both in, in, in transferring some of the knowledge that we're learning from, from one model to another without having to read uh, all of the data and retrain on it from scratch. And, and there's also methods where um, you can use models to you know, choose what data is, was most valuable for that model for other models to train on. 
Um, and and th those those methods, I think, are, are are fairly interesting and transferable to to other people. Um, you know, uh, uh, doing it now. Um, and uh, and I, I think there was one more question. Uh, how can what you've learned and are doing at Google be made accessible to all the other people doing data centers that aren't just running on GCP? Right. Uh, well, I, I think uh, panels like this are probably first and foremost. Um, I mean, we do encourage publications. Um, uh, I think there is there there is a a lot of collaborations in the space uh, across the industry and and with academia. So. Um, yeah, I, I guess maybe I would turn the question back around to you. Uh, so let me, that's awesome. Let me open it up to the, the floor as well. Um, I see a hand uh, there just for one question. Um, so you briefly mentioned the use of compression as a key to data management strategies for ML. I was wondering to what extent lossy compression strategies have been considered. Um, excluding, for example, principal component analysis and other kind of model or embeddings where it's more on the, more heavily tied to the exact domain of the application, like just lossy compression in general applied in these areas. I think when it comes to training data, I haven't seen as much of that being done. Um, like there, there are certainly, like you, you can almost think of some of the techniques to reduce the size of your models as a form of compression that is lossy. Um, but when it comes to the actual data sets themselves, I think there's 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 certainly interest in the space of um, uh, distribution specific compression algorithms. So like learning a compression algorithm for your data set that that works better. Um, but um, as far as like looking at things like uh, PCA or, or other things to uh, like other forms of lossy compression algorithms. Um, it, 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 it may be an interesting space to look at. The, the challenges are is um, data quality is something that you really want to emphasize in machine learning. Um, so uh, I, I think there's always going to be a challenge and uh, um, you know, something in the back of your head when, when evaluating the quality of your models if you, know, you can't verify the quality of your data. Awesome. Thanks, Abdul. All right, let's move on to uh, CJ. Um, can you give us your perspective? Sure, I have to. Um, I didn't really want to uh, present a lot, but um, maybe it helps sometimes. Uh, pictures were 1,000 words, so uh, I can just share something a bit from that. So our take is that we're going to see an explosive demand uh, for poor data centers, and that those data centers, you know, lots of people want to have HPC infrastructure, but are doing lots of AI. And that makes solving this problem really a data center problem. People are going to be doing AI by itself, uh, but also largely uh, lever leveraging uh, deep learning frameworks, but they're also going to be doing HPC with AI, where AI <coughs> is used to accelerate things, and I'll talk about that more in a bit. So one of the things that uh, if you compare with sort of what we've already been doing for a long time in HPC, the criticality of the storage is pretty different. Celine, which is number six in the top 500, has more luster bandwidth than any other supercomputing center in order to process data. And then still the number one complaint is an inadequate network uh, file system bandwidth. So we have uh, two terabytes per second at luster, uh, sort of an order of magnitude more of that, at, at 20 terabytes per second with local aggregated storage. And then you can think in terms of 200 terabytes per second DRAM. And so that's you know kind of an order of magnitude drop in performance for each order of magnitude increase in capacity, and it's kind of like CPU caches and hierarchy as to how much you need at each step. So one of the things that's quite different in this space is that we see much more control over choreography of data management. But there's tiering, so you can if if you are uh, doing autonomous vehicles and you train a model, you can never ever throw away the data that you use to train them. So <laughs> you need some way to have archival storage, um, but you also can't afford to keep that close by, right? Um, so you can also think of uh, this, uh, you know, many other forms of where data is coming from. Huge amounts of more data are gonna be coming from the edge, uh, but also from simulation. 
And there's no way, again, that you can have a human in the loop to automate that tag generation and using the tags to keep uh, to know what to keep near or far, to evaluate or rate the quality data, which can really impact both the training and other uses. So we're really anticipating a restructuring of the data center architecture. So you get, as shown here, you have remote storage. You may have some cluster local storage because you may have a skinny straw. Oh, CJ, I was gonna, just gonna say, are you are you presenting? Um, I'm not actually uh, seeing I thought it was. A, uh, I thought it was. A, a slide. Let me try again. Thank you, appreciate that. Okay. There we go. Sweet, thanks for the interaction. So, um, uh, you see kind of a skinny straw over here, uh, getting to remote storage, um, but something much bigger. Uh, we may end up seeing uh, storage that's more inside the clusters, uh, that's more converged. We're using also the same mix uh, to be able to get both to other GPU clusters for multi-node training and to be able to get to that storage. Um, and uh, we may also see more training that's happening out by the storage, sort of more uh, uh, smart computational storage, where maybe you use an S3 Lambda to train as you store, or you're using inference based on whatever you have uh, the trained and stored data there. So um, the key thing here, I think, is you want to have a smooth data at line rate uh, on a fast network all the way to the GPUs. We have RDMA everywhere. Um, we have something called GPU direct storage to bypass the CPU on the path between the NIC and the GPUs. Um, and uh, you have sort of these, as uh, much as you possibly can running uh, with accelerated computing and having your whole workflows there. And then inside the GPUs being able to decompress the data right there. So the remarkable thing that we're seeing with um, GPU direct storage is that you can actually get data out of uh, remote storage uh, at full line rate faster than you can get it from the local CPU's memory. And that just kind of takes a bunch of things and turns them on their head. Um, maybe just a couple of comments uh, in the spirit of what we're after here. If you look at characteristics, um, uh, some factors that uh, affect the IO criticality, I think computational intensity, that varies a lot. Uh, uh, whether you can manage to make all your accesses asynchronous versus bulk synchronous. And looking at the interplay between uh, the network uh, being used for deal training uh, versus uh, for storage. So we see, uh, just to kind of uh, wrap up with this, uh, you know, it, it used to be that a workload was just kind of a simple one and done with HPT. But now we see these very complicated workflows uh, that have, you know, might be at the edge where you're doing sensor and process control, where you're using inference, where you're doing training as you go along, where you have some simulation to look at what you're, based on these other inputs, what's going on and uh, post-processing the data uh, before you get to output. A lot of the things we're seeing is a lot of this takes visual form and so a lot of the data is uh, essentially in visual form because it's easier to process and we have a lot more acceleration available for being able to do that. Um, and so not every workflow is going to look like this, but many of us are used to thinking of AI as just, you know, oh, I'm going to look at a bunch of images and do a bunch of training. Uh, I think that at, uh, sort of the data center gets complemented all this work that's going on at the edge that we're going to see a much more complicated and richer management of data uh, that's going to introduce lots and lots of fun for us researchers. And I'll stop there. Awesome. Thanks, CJ. Uh, and I would assume that if you layer on uh, this uh, workflow that you've described here with the hundreds of the thousands of ML engineers that Abdul's talking about, um, just gets a little more complicated. Um, so is there any other questions from the, the panel initially? Uh, we also have one on Slido and that I'm seeing. Uh, no, all right, let's, uh, let's move to the Slido one, Jay. Okay, so the question is to CJ, what is the difference between cluster storage and remote storage in terms of purpose? Sure. Um I think that there's an opportunity that you have for uh, being able to uh, get higher, more controlled bandwidth where uh, locality exists, uh, and you can make use of that. You may prefetch something, you know, think of S3 that's way out in some other data center, right? Um, 
and you need to bring that in, there's it's not very likely that you can, that there's a super fast link all the way across the internet to operate at line rate for what you need here. And so um, uh, you, or even the data center, you may have uh, physically distributed stuff, but being able to have something that's cluster local, um, that uh, you can minimize the interference, you can maximize the bandwidth, and uh, it may be more specialized or pre-filtered or data managed, um, both for what you get into the cluster local storage and what you can cache in your local storage. So think of it as just a, a typical memory hierarchy of what it is you can do where faster stuff that's better managed or more carefully managed is closer. to. Awesome. Um, should I open up I to the room? Oh, I have ahead. a follow-up question for, sure. for this exact thing. Uh, what do you think is, where do you think are we in terms of software maturity? Like, I mean, these things you're talking about, the tiering and managing things, moving around, selecting the, the, the best possible uh, piece of information of the best time possible and all of these things. I know you guys working with the GPU direct storage, great work, um, I'm a fan of it. Um, but in general, how how, where do you think we are in terms of software, like supporting all of that? And uh, is there any areas of opportunity there? So my tongue in cheek uh, answer is that there are a lot of folks that would say that we've arrived. I totally don't believe it. I think that we're very much in infancy. I think we're just barely getting going. Um, and I don't think we need lots of really smart humans uh, to be able to point AI at a lot of these problems. Um, and I think that the place where I'm always a big believer in driving tech with solving specific problems. So we as a company, we have this drive AV stuff, right? So we learned a lot about data centers by just managing that stuff, uh, dog fooding our own uh, work. Um, we have, uh, you know, many different data centers that are spread around the world, including the stuff that we're doing with gaming, right? So I think that we need to find uh, specific cases and usage models, work those through, solve the specific problems. Um, we acquired Swift Stack, and uh, that's one of the uh, loci where uh, this early work with figuring out how to do da federated data management is important. I think that we're looking at um, interactions with some government labs in that space, too, to solve some of the specific problems, for example, at the edge and other areas. Awesome. Uh, let me open up to the, the room here as well. Is there any anyone like to ask CJ specifically a question at this point? Yeah, I see a hand uh, over in the corner there. Hello, so local storage. I'm assuming that's some work set that's um, being modeled or trained against. How large typically is that? We often see that, um, I'm just trying to think of numbers here. Um, we started in our systems, like our DGX systems, where each node has an order of eight drives. Um, and I think the initial versions of those were 3.84 terabytes and they're going up from there. Um, so think in terms of 25 terabytes total is initially enough to be able to get in a set of images that you might then train on for a few hours. Um, we're seeing those numbers go up. We're seeing the demand go up um, and uh, the demand for uh, sort of fatter pipes and more network bandwidth uh, to feed that and restock that is also going up. Um, I think that we a lot of the work that's been done has really been on images, um, but um, we'll see, uh, for example, if you want to look, um, uh, you've seen this plug at 1215 uh, Central, there's a, a buff on accelerating storage IO GPUs, and we'll show some cases there where, for example, Verizon is doing some things with uh, arenas and so on. Um, so there's going to be a lot more happening in video analytics, and that, of course, uh, requires more data. So, I, you know. There's, you know which way things are going to go in the trends, right? Awesome. And it gets into some of the things I want to talk about uh, after uh, the speakers finish around, um, you know, the workloads and how that impacts, uh, impacts the design there in terms of local versus non-local storage. Um, so that's awesome. Uh, Anthony, uh, can you take it away?
Yeah, thank you very much for uh, the opportunity to be here. Thank you, Dean. Thank you, Jay. Great company. Uh, I've been learning as well today. Um, can you guys see my screen? Yes, we see it. I'm going to you know, have a couple of slides. Um, so um, we took a little bit of a different um, route of looking at you know, beyond the hype. And um, we, we've been working with like Argo National Laboratory and Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory in terms of uh, characterizing and understanding the patterns and the IO behavior of, of deep learning workloads. Um, Again, do we think this is a revolution? Do we think this is entirely new? Have we seen this before? Uh, how much stress these, the, you know, these workloads put on, um, on the storage? These are like typical questions we wanted like, to look into and um, try to get some answers. This is ongoing work. Um, we had a publication um, in CC Grid about this. Uh, and there are a couple of interesting things. So one is understanding um, you know, the behavior of your workload and, and is this going to be uh, an activity that you do specifically in your workload and then what kind of optimizations can you do on it? What's the impact of those optimizations? Um, so as before that there are a bunch of IO benchmarks out there, we set to understand a, a, a collection of applications and see if we could build up um, a, a benchmark tool that you can just simply stress test your systems, do a change, run it again, uh, do a different pattern, do a different interface, uh, these kind of things, because we believe, A, tools like that should exist um, in order to stress test your machines, your, you know, your libraries, your middleware, um, and things like that. So, and so there are you know, two dimensions here. First, understanding what the applications actually are doing, and then getting that into like a tool or a benchmark that can actually be used in the community and, and, and see you know, what kind of results we can get from these things. Um, I'm going to just you know, summarize like, some of the key findings we, we found um, during this study, and we're still learning about it. Um, first thing is IO should not be studied um, in isolation. Uh, and what do I mean with that? Because we often see you know, applications overlap I.O., uh, and that's more crucial uh, in terms of um, the behavior. Like, if, if I.O. is ha hidden behind computation, why, why you, know, you don't care? Like, you need, you need to understand that these are you know, different things there. And profiling tools, um, they're kind of complicated in a sense of what kind of granularity and level of information you can you capture. Like um, Fei Yi mentioned Darshan, and yes, we use Darshan here. We also use Recorder. Uh, we use a bunch of uh, CPU profilers and, and you know, memory footprint profilers. And if you see all of this plethora of, of data you collect, um, it's quite hard to put them in a timeline and understand you know, is it the framework, TensorFlow, doing something on your I.O.? Is it the storage system doing something? Is it the real the application itself? Does the application use a middleware library that changes the, the pattern from what the application is doing? So profiling different components needs to be combined. Uh, we need to be able to capture, uh, you know, different components and different uh, undislayered architecture and, and try to put them together to understand their behavior. Another thing we've seen was IO request sizes from applications do not uh, always um, guarantee the transfer size. So for instance, we saw in cases of uh, HDFI being used, uh, applications issued like 60 kilobyte IO, but the actual IO over the parallel file system was just four kilobytes uh, because of what the HDFI library is doing and uh, specifically chunking. Um, and then we, other things we've, we've noticed, TensorFlow data pipeline um, does allow uh, you know, good sequential I.O. Um, and that could benefit parallel file systems. In our studies, uh, we, we use Luster uh, in both machines, in Argon and Livermore. Um, but you know, I, I suspect uh, similar parallel file systems would uh, you know, have similar benefits from sequential I.O. Uh, so yeah, it's an opportunity there. How can we just uh, make sure we look at the, bi the pipelines, the ingestion pipelines, and the training pipelines in terms of I/O, and, and make sure that you know we issue l big chunks of sequential I/O over the parallel file system. 
Uh, large scale applications also, uh, maybe a misconception between scientists or, or, or people that use that. A lot of the times they don't really read, as, as someone said earlier, just the picture, like an image, and just keep doing training. A lot of these you know, frameworks are actually doing um, their own proprietary interfaces or, or data formats, like you know, the TF records, and they read a bunch of uh, data together into these chunks, and then they feed the images into the pipeline. So that kind of randomness between randomly picking images versus chunking things together and pushing them into memory and randomly shuffling things in memory, like different applications code these things differently. And there's again an opportunity there in terms of how do we optimize ingestion pipelines. And then specifically for like eight scientific deep learning applications we looked at, uh, and there's a bunch of lists in the publication, of course, but uh, some interesting maybe statistics uh, we, we found. IO time, overall IO time on these jobs ranges between 12 and 36%. Is that data intensive enough? Uh, what does it mean to be data intensive? Uh, you, know, you know, these are things that we, we saw in terms of um, characterization of behavior. Some of them were like, you know, more heavy on reading. Some of them were uh, less heavy. One thing we saw is some of the applications really went um, out of their way to overlap I.O. behind computations. Not all of them do that. Um, and it's not very often, actually, that they do that. This is a big opportunity there as well. There are some small accesses from metadata as well, like, um, and it shouldn't be ignored. Uh, a lot of the times, these jobs and, and frameworks, they keep looking up of metadata. And uh, it's not the same with the simulations, where you know you, you would be very good if you move your metadata into like a hot cache or like an NVMe drive. And, but they're still there. It's not just pure data reading. And another, I guess, observation there, POSIX is still here. Um, I'm not sure, again, I, that's my personal view, but I'm not sure how much we need of that uh, semantic of the standard, if this is imposing overheads, do we really need in machine learning, I.O., and deep learning I.O., this kind of guarantees and semantics, is this different, do we need to develop a new standard? The, you know, this is kind of a couple of the questions we, we had uh, in this study. But yeah. Um, Pretty much this is, that's, that's it. Uh, the benchmark is available for the community, for researchers, for students, for practitioners, if they want to like stress test things. Uh, you can apply a few of the optimizations within the benchmark and see what was the impact on the, on the execution. Uh, but thank you for the opportunity to talk to you today. Awesome. Thanks, Anthony. Uh, anyone on the panel uh, want to ask a question to Anthony uh, first? I might have missed it, but what types of jobs did you profile to get this information and then design the benchmark? Um, I, it was a lot of them. Um, I, I, you know, I don't know if you see my screen right now, but yep. I, I do have some of them and some information. I just didn't want to <laughs> really present a lot of things today. Uh, but you know, a, a bunch of scientific applications and, 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 and I would say kernels, like uh, smaller jobs, like. Uh, you know, ImageNet benchmarks and deep learning climate segmentation benchmarks and, and things like that. So did most of it come from the, just to follow up on that, uh, come from the, the, the benchmarks that we're running or are most of them coming from actual like production level? Uh, there were models? actual production. Uh, only, only two of them are benchmarks from mm -hmm. these eight applications. The rest of them are actual uh, applications running at scale. Uh, we run them on, at uh, Argon. And, um, and Livermore. So we're looking at like 8,000 nodes and quite, quite good scale to understand the impact. Gotcha. I'm trying to decide if we should uh, get delve into this now or, or wait a bit before we get into uh, the, the overall question that we started off the entire uh, panel with. But uh, I think we're going to wait on that one in terms of just like whether, you know, is there a single workload? Um, but, but, you know, this is an awesome uh, start to that question. Um, is there anything on the, the Slido at the moment? Um, just questions that are more appropriate for the... Uh, the general? The general, yeah. Okay. Is there any uh, specific question for Anthony from the, the audience at the moment? Maybe just a quick comment. I think being able to understand what the bottlenecks are throughout the data center is a hard problem now, and it's going to get worse. And if you can make that better, that's awesome. <laughs> 
and make it universally accept, you know, accessible to everybody uh, and understanding, which I think is an even harder problem. Awesome. I agree. Thank you. Uh, nope, no question at the moment. Oh, there is one over in the middle. Hello. So do you think there is not enough initiation to fix or optimize this problem in the frameworks like TensorFlow, TensorFlow or PyTorch or X, XYZ? Actually, I think they're doing a fantastic job. Um, there are a lot of optimizations and, and you know, these frameworks are developed like very smartly and intelligently. However, what we see is that sometimes uh, it's replicated effort like something that TensorFlow is doing well, maybe PyTorch is doing better, or, or vice versa. And, and, and as, as someone said earlier, I think Fei Yi, from the user perspective in a, in a DOE site, everybody has different preferences. They can use whatever libraries they want to use in different frameworks. And uh, one opportunity here is that are there common or commonalities between some of these optimizations? Uh, you know, prefetching being like an obvious one, like does, does the framework allow like a smart prefetching and tiering? No. Are we going there? Uh, possibly. Uh, there are some academic projects that they're trying, you know, to leverage those frameworks and try to kind of have a abstraction over the frameworks and, and remove some of the eye optimizations from the frameworks and implement them generally. So all of the frameworks can inherit that, um, which is pretty interesting. But um, they're doing some, some work within the framework and, and some, some, as I said, mostly academic uh, outside of frameworks. Uh, I don't know if, I'm, if I answered your question. Good. Yeah, definitely. Uh, thanks. All right. So let's move on to our last panelist. Uh, Anna, please take it away. Okay. Great, thank you. Uh, so yeah, just a bit of context, I guess, before joining uh, ETH Zurich as an assistant professor, I spent some time at Google and I was collaborating closely with the TF data team, which is the input uh, data processing library that's native in TensorFlow. Um, so maybe I'll talk a bit about sort of uh, some insights from, uh, from a fleet-wide analysis that we did across millions of machine learning input data processing jobs uh, at Google. And um, this kind of goes towards the reason why we were doing this fleet-wide analysis was kind of trying to understand to what extent um, ML training jobs are bottlenecked on input data processing. And as uh, CJ uh, commented, measuring this is, is not necessarily, uh, necessarily easy, but it does help to have one framework um, that is used by a, a large chunk of jobs. Um, so a lot of TensorFlow jobs at, uh, at Google are indeed using TF data. And so this gave us sort of a way to, uh, to profile them and see, uh, see what's going on. Uh, and we, we found that actually, if you look at uh, total cycle spent in an ML job, a large portion uh, on average around 30% go towards input data processing. Um, and so uh, it's, it's a significant amount of compute time that's uh, being spent, and it's not just compute cycles, but memory bandwidth and just power in general that's, that's uh, going towards input data processing and machine learning. And this really emphasizes the, um, the point that uh, you need to optimize uh, that part of the stack as well when you care about end-to-end -end performance, uh, because indeed uh, we saw that quite often you can be bottlenecked on input data processing. Uh, we also looked at sizes of data sets uh, and concluded that, yeah, these data sets are, are large and the jobs that spent uh, the most resources are ones that, whose data sets uh, definitely do not fit uh, in memory, even if you could assume one terabyte memory on a machine, uh, it definitely goes uh, beyond that scale. And uh, in terms of like common I.O. patterns observed and so on, we found that in general, there's quite a bit of, of repetition of not just uh, reading the same data, but even pre-processing it in the same ways. And I think this comes often from cases of uh, you're doing something like hyperparameter tuning or model search where you're tweaking the model, but actually your input data pipeline is the same. Um, and so TF data actually does have caching operators or snapshot operators that users could insert uh, into their pipeline to reuse data across epochs in a job or even across jobs. Like you could write a snapshot or a materialized view basically of your input pipeline to storage. But when we looked at how frequently those ops were actually being used in practice, it was quite low. Like I think caching was 19% of jobs were making use of it and um, snapshot at that time was, was uh, quite a bit less. And so I think overall some conclusions um, were that in general, people using TensorFlow and, and PyTorch and so on 
even at a place uh, like Google where they are expert uh, software engineers, um, they're not necessarily, yeah, they're, they're, it's hard for users to be aware of all the different things that are impacting the performance of their job. And so I think it's really helpful if we can build services that automate a lot of these decisions, especially things like resource management, uh, how many CPU cores to, to use to, pr uh, to process data for a model that's using this many GPUs, like the, that ratio that you need um, so that input data is not a bottleneck and also that your GPUs are being well utilized. Um, while also not leaving extra CPUs lying around. That sweet spot is, is really different for each job, for each model, for each hardware config. Uh, and so it's going to be difficult for users to, to get it right. Um, so I think, yeah, one of the things that I'm excited about and we're working on uh, as part of um, my, my research at, with my group at ETH, but also in collaboration with Google is kind of building um, a service uh, on top of uh, like extending the what's called TF data service, which kind of disaggregates input data processing across uh, multiple nodes and uh, makes scaling and caching decisions automatically for users. Uh, so hopefully this goes a little bit also towards uh, what Abdul was saying, where I think it'd be cool for this kind of service also to be capable of things like data discovery and uh, and so on, but we're kind of in the early stages still. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, thanks, Anna. Um, any questions from the panel initially? To kick off, I know uh, this dream that uh, we could help application users, you know, figure out how to use storage automatically. I mean, that does sound... Uh, that's my magic wand that I'll use. But anyways, uh, any other thoughts? Yeah, maybe I'll elaborate a bit about what I mean by service here, that uh, basically you would just define your input pipeline and uh, the execution of the input pipeline, like the compute and therefore also the reading from storage, would, would happen through uh, a, a cloud service, essentially, uh, which would decide how many workers to use and uh, could also decide actually where where that data that you're reading should be uh, stored. So maybe it starts in something like S3, but uh, it's propagated uh, to, uh, to faster storage, like uh, the cluster storage, for example, that CJ referred to, um, based on not just how this job is using it, but potentially multiple jobs that are using this shared service. Awesome. I have a question that I can ask. Yeah, Abdul. Yeah, so I'm curious your thoughts on um, like when it comes to building a, a shared service that is like uh, dynamically materializing uh, reads or transforms from users and sharing them across input pipeline, pipelines, how good um, do you think we are at being able to understand the transforms that are happening inside of an input pipeline? Um, do you think what TF data provides is enough? Do you think that we need um, uh, better DSLs that are, you know, that can be, you know, you know, or intermediate representations that, you know, can be yeah. better over data. Yeah, that's a really good question. Like I, the approach we're taking right now is sort of doing an exact uh, hash of the ops in the graph, but there's uh, this. It, it gets tricky also, especially because I mean, it's kind of a tussle between having a general framework that let, lets you express arbitrary computations, and with TF data, you can have user-defined functions inside of maps, um, which is great. But then, yeah, it becomes uh, more difficult to say how do we how do we reason about which two TF data pipeline graphs uh, even if some ops are reordered but you know maybe those ops are commutative so how do you detect that those actually are um, uh, equivalent pipelines uh, and this I think is is an interesting question I I, I don't know yet I think that yeah it, it, it is this kind of trade off there um, where we want the generality but yeah it's uh, it makes things difficult to automatically analyze. Awesome. I think we have a question on uh, the Slido as well. Uh, yes, we actually have a few. Um, the, the first one was looking at um, what's the denominator in the job. So you said you had 10 to 30 percent overhead, and they were trying to figure out um, is that a small amount of overhead in terms of time, or are these long-running jobs where that 10 to 30 percent is significant? Right. Yeah. Um, we like yeah, thirty percent uh, is what we found on average is the is the overhead, and, and this is uh, this is significant. Um, these are typically long running jobs uh, that consume a lot of nodes as well. So uh, it's sort of yeah, the the amount of I guess the the concern. Uh, this doesn't mean that thirty percent is um, is really like the time that the GPUs are are idling or so on. This is sort of uh, looking at 
compute cycles if you could kind of normalize time spent on uh, on a particular resource. Um, and also related to how expensive that resource is, 30% of uh, those normalized compute cycles are going towards uh, I.O. pre-processing and or reading I.O. All right, thank you. So the follow-up one says that uh, out of that 30% that is spent on pre-processing, what percentage are I.O. and what percentage is pre-processing compute? And is the pre-processing I.O. bottlenecked? Yes, uh, good question. So. Um, maybe I should also mention we, we have uh, more, I guess, the complete information about our profiling is in a VLDB paper from, from this year um, called TF Data. So we described the TF Data framework, but also this fleet-wide analysis in the second half. Um, but these things are, are, yeah, some of these things are really hard to, to measure in general on, on a fleet-wide um, perspective. So we don't really have a good breakdown as to uh, what percentage of jobs are stalled on the actual I.O. reads. Um, versus, uh, you know, how well the pipelining, how well I/O and compute are pipelined in the the pre-processing. Um, so that's yeah, that's one thing our analysis didn't really do a, a breakdown of. Um, but yeah, I suspect that this also really varies across jobs. Okay, we're more. Uh, anyone from the room at the moment? Oh, I see in the back there. Okay. Yeah, hello, uh, Maurice Riedel, University of Iceland and Jülich Supercomputing Center. Thanks, Anna. Um, you have reflected, I think, very good discussions about hyperparameter tuning and the whole pipeline, which many people forget to do regularization and validation. My question would be going to this service that you mentioned and your research. Um, we use Raytune, for instance. It has many algorithms for this hyperparameter search. Do you use existing tools like Raytune and, let's say, um, make that better, or is your solutions kind of open source that, you know, other computing centers could work with this or is just Google closed source in the moment. And then I would have, if the panel allows, two orthogonal questions to this, which would be the first, how you see in the future ONNX playing into this, so a standardization of all these models. Um, and then the second would be if you scale up. Obviously, um, in our research at least, the batch size matters a lot. So if you have large batch sizes, the accuracy drops like hell if you do more than 100 GPUs. What do you do to cure that? <laughs> Thank you very much. Sure, thanks. Uh, maybe I'll go for the first question and then we can open it up um, to everyone for, for the other two. So um, regarding the service that I mentioned, we're actually building on top of the open source TF data code base. Um, and TF data uh, already has something called TF data service. Uh, which allows you to distribute input data processing across workers. So this is not really at all specific to hyperparameter tuning jobs or anything like that. This is more um, like if you were running Raytune and if you were using um, TensorFlow as a framework plugged into Ray, then the an IO uh, library you were using was TF data. You could use TF data service and um, and then what we'd build on top are cache automatic scaling and caching policies that um, try to automate some of these difficult decisions for users. So it is open source. Uh, I'll open it up. I, I, uh, I'll admit that I kind of didn't catch the second part of the question, but um, did the panel hear it or did they want it repeated? So I think one question was about the Onyx format for models and what mm -hmm. the impact of that is, uh, standardizing Precisely, the model. yeah. ONNX is this open network exchange. I mean, basically a standard, if you will. Uh, for exchanging between PyTorch, TensorFlow, and, and all of that in the future may be interesting. And the you know last question was more around the batch sizes, which has some impact in this I/O and uh, data structures, I think. Or large batch sizes. I mean that that is a key problem here, not not the small batch size. Would uh, anyone else um, from the panel like to tackle that one first? Or Anna, if you'd like to. I don't know a lot about uh, the Onyx format, to be honest, but my impression is that uh, it is about uh, the models themselves. Um, so I guess it would be good to have some kind of equivalent, uh, more data loading frameworks that can be used across uh, different frameworks. And I mean, actually with TF data, you could, um, you could have a TF data input pipeline uh, and use it, read that from a PyTorch, uh, like, uh, program that's doing the model training. Um, in, in general, you, you can do this. Um, and TF data service actually makes this even easier because you really disaggregate the, you have a service for input data processing and you have your training clients, which could be PyTorch jobs or TensorFlow or anything else. Um, so 
yeah, I guess uh, I sort of see it as it's it's nice to have frameworks that can interoperate at the I/O processing as well as the model side. But um, maybe someone's more familiar with the Onyx format and can talk about that. Maybe I'll I'll uh, up level the con conversation a bit to the using multiple frameworks. I don't know, Faye, do you um, have a thought there in terms of like how Summit is being used, and do you have problems optimizing for a variety of different frameworks? Um. Yeah, I'll make a quick comment on the batch size first. Uh, so uh, we actually uh, have a few staff members in my team are looking at the try to um, increase the batch size for the distributed uh, deep, uh, deep learning. Uh, of course, when you have a large batch size, it's beneficial to the I/O system or the storage because it's more efficient. But on the other hand, you run into this convergence issue and the lower accuracy issue. I don't believe this is a solved question yet. I think that this is largely in the uh, uh, research and development phase. Um, but if you are interested, I can certainly uh, introduce uh, a few folks in my team that are more specialized around that. Uh, I think, uh, Dean, you asked for a second question regarding the uh, uh, heterogeneous uh, framework, is that correct? Yeah, I was just thinking about, um, you know, at a high level what I'm noticing, and, and this gets into some other questions that we have, but, um, you know, the level of uh, optimization in the stack really affects uh, the tooling framework that they're using. Um, and so if you're trying to provide a general system uh, like you are at, at Summit, you know, if you are users coming in with, with TensorFlow and PyTorch and, you know, name the next one uh, and the next seven that will be coming along, uh, do you struggle to, to try to get all of them optimized? Oh, oh definitely. Oh. Um, <laughs> that's a definitive yes. Uh, yeah. So uh, usually, um, when we, uh, we we do support the both PyTorch and the TensorFlow and whatnot other frameworks, or as usually requested, for example, uh, uh, there uh, th th there are other frameworks proposed by Microsoft, etc. User want to use it, we have no choice but to try to make it scale up. But usually, I guess in our particular case, uh, the user will uh, be assigned a liaison, sort of work with our staff member on a one-on-one -on -one basis, try to try to understand their problem. So definitely, we don't have a. Uh, you mentioned the retune. Yes, retune is another framework. We actually have a deployment, but nonetheless, it was not advertised to the general audience. Simply, uh, the use uh, the user base of it is relatively small, and uh, we we don't have a uh, kind of like a general and the generic service can address all the uh, complexity, uh, you know, incurred by the heterogeneous framework. Um, but we try to do our best from a facility supporting point of view. Awesome. Um, so I know there's another question, but I'm going to um, get to my question uh, first, which is back to the, the title of the, the talk, is there a single workload? So um, back to what uh, Jay had said earlier, you know, so we have a lot of benchmarks out there. Uh, we're uh, also helping to organize the IO500 benchmarks, and we don't have an ML specific one in there. Uh, but it is something that we have considered, and that brought up a lot of uh, discussions, is the best way to, to put it, around what is uh, an ML workload. And uh, when I talk uh, to most people about, well, I want to do ML you know, benchmark testing, they usually forward me to ResNet. Um, and I, you know, I want to stress the storage system. And I'm going to throw it out to the panel initially is, do you think the benchmarks we have for evaluating um, ML storage uh, is basically, do we have the right benchmarks? Um, I'm going to throw it to Abdul first because I think I know the answer that he's going to say, but um, I, I'd like to hear him say it. Um, I, I saw a few people shaking their heads, so I, I think they may agree with me here, but I, I, I think, in my opinion, no. Um, uh, there are a lot of different, um, like depending on what you're doing, the, the ML lifecycle you know, ha has a lot of different um, phases. And like, if, if you look at where we're spending the most uh, computational resources and, and even disk time, you know, it's not in running these models that uh, we already know what the data is and, and we're just like piling through the data sequentially and, and training models. A lot of it is, you know, iterative experimentation with data. Um, 
and 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 manipulating data on this, trying to find new forms of uh, ways how to how to access our, our data sets. So, you know, these you know produce very heterogeneous workloads, um, and uh, I, I don't think there's there's easy ways to capture that um, in in a specific data set. Uh, maybe CJ, I'll, I'll go to you next. Sure. Uh, we think that this problem is so important that even for internal work, uh, we have basically uh, have a dedicated team that's identifying uh, common characteristics, uh, well, basically a, a meaningful set of surrogate workloads. Uh, we then take and characterize and try to boil down to their essence. Uh, they're carefully curated and uh, profiled. So we have a whole team that's doing that, and there are many of this, right? Uh, so there's no one answer there. Maybe um, I can just um, yeah, squeeze in one quick comment too. One of the things that were, that, um, which I think is where you're headed with this, what are some of the key characteristics of the patterns? One of the things that we see is like rain rates all over the place. And then the question is, how do you contain that? And one of the most useful things we've found to do is to basically say, thou shalt use a one container. You can have, because commonly we see 100,000 4K files, but that's the most common pattern. And so saying, you can put anything you want into this 1K, or excuse me, one megabyte unit, um, and we'll prefetch that or manage the locality of that thing or whatever, and you can do all the random reads you want to within that. That just makes things, makes life so much better. And without doing that, your data center is going to grind a lot. So can you dig into that just for like 30 seconds? By one container, do you mean um, just like a, a group Data of... container, not a... Oh, I see, inside the framework. Execution container. Gotcha, gotcha. Sorry, gotcha. I meant, meant to make sure that I said data in front of an editor. <laughs> um, uh, let's see, maybe I'll open it up um, now to the, the audience. We have, uh, since we have about 10 minutes left, uh, I see there's one in the back there. Hi, uh, Pavan Balaji, Facebook AI. Uh, thank you for the great panel. Uh, my question was uh, more with respect to the uh, power usage of the storage systems and data processing. Just to give a little bit of a background, unlike our peer hyperscalers like Google and Microsoft, we at Facebook have a, uh, the bigger problem we have is that of power, the, literally the actual power coming into the data center buildings. So uh, power is a big constraint for us. And uh, the storage plus the data processing part, uh, that takes up between a third and a fifth, uh, third and a half of the power usage for the entire training job. Um, and a lot of this power comes because we have many models running. It's one data set sitting in storage. So we have to, and not all models need all of the data. So we uh, pull everything to warm storage, uh, memory maybe. and uh, find the subset of the data that we need for each of our models. I was wondering if this is a problem that others are seeing how you are handling the power situation uh, for, for just processing, pre-processing the data even before you start the training uh, with the data. Uh, who'd like to tackle that one first? Or is that to anyone specific or just to the panel? To the entire panel. Yeah. Anyone like to go first? I think I can comment, maybe. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, I think this goes a lot to what Anna is working on. Um, but, um, you know, one of the things that we're seeing is, um, you know, really need, needing to uh, memoize the, the computation that we're doing for, for data processing. Um, and a lot of times that's hard to do. Like, you know, you know when we are materializing these data sets, uh, a, a lot of times, a, a lot of the data, the experimentation that we want to do with types of transforms on the data, you know, exist when we're doing iterative model development. Um, but, you know, this is something that I like to call late materialization, where, you know, a lot of the materialization decisions happen late in the model training pipeline. And I, I think investing in a service that can actually share these materializations um, across models is something that, you know, is, is is necessary for for scaling up ML engineering. 
Yeah. Might also be interesting to kind of uh, be able to analyze pipelines and split which parts of the pipeline augment data, like inflate it versus reduce it uh, by doing some kind of filtering and so on. Because if you can filter the data early on and then do the uh, and do that close to storage and then uh, do the operations that might augment data uh, and inflate the, the volume of it uh, close to where you have the training nodes, that, that could also help. Um, but just uh, actually one thing we're finding doing this kind of work from, from academia and then basically having access mostly to, to benchmarks um, relating to Dean's uh, earlier question. I think one thing we've noticed and uh, when I compare sort of the workloads I had access to while at Google versus these kind of benchmark workloads, um, one thing that's really clear is that this like dynamic nature of the data sets and um, the fact that the benchmark data sets are all kind of clean uh, data, like you, you sort of have the ImageNet images uh, already, you're not sort of filtering through them or discarding ones that, that are um, have incomplete information or, or things like that. So we don't see as much of this filtering uh, that is that was something we saw in real workloads, uh, but in the benchmarks, it's mostly about inflating data that's, um, yeah. So anyway, this is uh, another thing we've, we've seen. Now, that's a really interesting point. A Anthony, have you uh, done any investigation onto those aspects of it, like the cleaning and filtering and those aspects, like the pre-processing steps versus just the, you know, already? Not a lot. Not a lot, I would say. Um, but, yeah, uh, again, we didn't, we didn't have, we haven't done yet. Uh, we, it's ongoing work, so, yeah, <laughs> I'm, I'm taking notes here. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Um, yeah. There's no we have Slido? Question. Uh, we, don't, we have we have we have three questions that came into Slido that really were more general questions, so we held them to the end. And uh, some of these may be quick, and other ones may be a little more discussion. So uh, we'll start with the first one that I have written here, and that's: uh, Are there common AI or ML libraries, for example, like HDF5 is uh, for HPC workloads, um, or is it just all POSIX or whatever they're randomly doing? Common libraries uh, across all of the frameworks, right? Potentially, yeah. Um, I don't know if I know any of any. Uh, what's the panel's thoughts on that one? No. Nope. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> nope, there is nope. not. Um, yeah. At I, least in the scientific community, we looked at uh, a lot of the people still use HD5 as there's you know kind of like I/O library and. and a lot of the data sets are stored in HDF5 format, and they're read from it, and then they're getting converted into some uh, format that is uh, you know, native to a framework or, or native to a language they're using or things like that. So there's a lot of um, you know, maybe translation costs there. Uh, is HDF5 optimized for ML? No, not really. Uh, does it have the potential to, to carry? forward some of the optimizations like smart prefetching and caching and you know evicting the right data at the right time and randomizing and do pre-processing things you know on the previous question uh, it could but um, is it the best one I don't know um, it, there is an opportunity here maybe to to have at least for again for the scientific community because there are a lot of uh, different formats, um, you know, HD5 being just one of them, there's like a, a lot of them and, and data sit in these different formats. So could we have a data container friendly for like, you know, similar with CJ that he said like, you know, here's your one megabyte thing, it will just read things from different uh, representations from, you know, sitting on a file system and keep doing this chunking and reading and chunking and reading. I think th this should be. It's, there is an opportunity here and we should have a representation that's friendly and agnostic to the framework, agnostic to the source representations, and potentially have some sort of intelligence within the representation uh, for typical um, you know, application, like optimizations within the deep learning pipeline. Awesome. Like I'd, I'd love to follow up on that one uh, a lot, but uh, I think we should move we don't on. Have we time. have a few minutes left. Yeah. yeah. So uh, this one, I think, is going to be a little more discussion, unfortunately, for our timing, but uh, I think great for us. And that is, given big machine learning workloads on HPC, uh, which way is the storage architecture going to move? Is it going to move from cloud to HPC or HPC to cloud or something else? Uh, Who would like to start on that one? Uh, and by HPC to cloud, maybe they mean file right. versus object, you think? Meaning like a 
traditional parallel file system versus like a key value store, an object store? Those would kind of think be the, the two extremes. And which way do we think it's going to move, or is there going to be some new architecture that ends up being able to service everything? I can just jump in quick. I think that um, there's a big shift. A lot of HPCs cared about writes, and AI mostly doesn't. It cares about reads. Um, and uh, being able to have a strong performance, especially within a cluster, but the enterprise capabilities uh, with the back end object store um, is, I think, a shift. So I see it as a marriage, um, not a war. I I, I just like to follow up with uh, CJ on that. I, I, I so the that's a million dollar question actually, cloud versus HPC and the storage wise. And I know some of the HPC center go for all flash solution and are going for a single parallel file system. Um, and some are trying some more novel. Uh, method such as sales. Uh, I think the jury is still out, but uh, if I try my crystal ball, I think it will more and more towards the hybrid solution. Um, some very specialized MLDL, uh, you know, highly specialized storage solution coexist with the traditional parallel file system. Um, that's my take. Awesome. Uh, yeah, that's also one that I wish we had another half an hour on. Um, I will say, though, that I noticed that almost other, uh, other than one or two brief mentions, in all of your talks, you never mention the words like files or object or whatever, right? That there, there is no requirements that I've ever seen of either one. It's just which, you know, what is the storage system that can meet the needs of the, the workloads that are running? And I always like to keep every conversation back to that point. Mm -hmm. um, so I think we're at the end. This has been awesome. I'm going to give each panel member then like 30 seconds or a minute to kind of wrap up their final thoughts. And uh, since you uh, gave the last talk, Anna, I'll start with you um, in terms of what's your final thoughts that you'd love the, the audience here to, to take away? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, it's been a great discussion of what, what's special about ML when it comes to, to storage. And I don't know, for me, uh, a yeah, I think things that stand out are, are the scale, um, the integration with accelerators, so the opportunity to kind of push uh, data more directly to to accelerators, I think, is, is a major requirement that hasn't really uh, come up so much before. And uh, and then this sort of idea of managing things automatically for users as much as possible, um, because they're, they're not going to be storage or systems experts, uh, or we can't expect them to be. And so how can we take on some of that burden and uh, give a more kind of serverless or automated experience to the cloud. I think we tried to make physicists storage experts for the last 30 years and we mm -hmm. failed. So, you know, I have to agree with this, this path. Um, so going back into reverse order, Anthony? Um, I think we, in this specific um, space, we need a little bit better tooling, instrumentation tooling, characterization of, you know, understanding its layer, because it's, it is a layered architecture. A lot of things are involved. A lot of libraries are involved. Uh, and in terms of storage design, I, I must agree with you know, previous comments from the panel that um, it's not a war. Uh, a lot of them are good for different reasons and different workloads. And I think um, personally, I, I'm exploring in my research, but you know, I invite the community to think of these things of more custom made ephemeral deployments that are good for specific things and then uh, you know, you have a menu of storage services, if you will. Like, like I want this, you know, my workload, my deep learning thing is doing a lot of this reading and the random thing. Let me spin up a key value store in, in memory, and that's great. Uh, but, you know, kind of like ephemeral custom tuned storage services, uh, I think that's the way we can go forward. Awesome. CJ? An observation is that I. Uh, Users and even admins are largely incapable of forecasting capacity and performance and other aspects of the future. So uh, being able to, you know, flexible abstraction is your friend and treating this as a data center wide and building in readers for frameworks or whatever that just work and do the right thing and that are very flexible so that users don't, and physicists don't need to change very much. That's really where we need to go. All right. Uh, let's see. Abdul. Um, yeah, I think all of the work that 
you know people on the panel are doing is great and um you know i i think we're seeing a lot of advancements in hardware acceleration to um you know with the idea to really push our ability to do more and more ml and i, I think it would be a shame if we were unable to take advantage of that because you know we're unable to to feed data fast enough so um you know i i definitely think it's an important space uh, i agree that um, I would really like to see more framework, framework agnostic solutions um, that can be used across frameworks and, and, and reusable across um, uh, developers. And, uh, and yeah, um, so I, I encourage uh, more uh, investments in this space. Uh, awesome, and last word goes to you, Fei. Uh, I'll offer some quick thoughts on this one. The first one is, um, uh, interface and the usability matters. This is echo back to Anthony's point where uh, we have been hearing about the object storage for decades. Um, still, POSIX rules on the ground. And uh, I think our burst buffer is a little bit underutilized uh, and to a large degree, I attribute to that the usability issue. Um, second point is the uh, uh, IO is first and also the last our user will complain. Um, by that, I meant if your job hands, if you cannot do an LS, you will hear the flooding tickets coming in, just complaints about it. But uh, the last, uh, it compl uh, it's last because if your IO job take 10 seconds versus it take 20 seconds, you are not going to hear about the user complaints at all. So the downside of this is if you, you, you really need a drastic improvement on IO to impress the end user or, or to make a difference. And that's not really easy. And the last point I want to make is, uh, this is also, I go back to the uh, one of the earlier question asking whether or not the data is available or what kind of data is available from the center. I think the, on this point is operational complexity is often underestimated. Uh, so uh, we are very much like to uh, have open collaboration and we can share our data, uh, but oftentimes, and uh, this include, uh, especially from the research side where they say, if you plus two, if you put this data set along this data set, and then you can derive certain insights and on the ground, it's always more complicated than that. It just takes time and effort to pull everything together. That's all. Awesome. All right. Well, my internal thanks to all uh, five of you, and thanks so much for spending your time. And thanks to everyone here that uh, could join, and hopefully uh, you really enjoyed the panel. So thanks to everyone. Thank <laughs> there we go.